All right, if I could have the kiddos come on up here and kind of sit right here. Before you go downstairs, you have to talk to me. And I won't put an age limit on it. If you consider yourself a kid, come on down. Just right here on the ground. I'm going to read you guys a story before you go downstairs. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. How are my favorite people doing? Good. You guys all got goldfish. You're happy. So I tried something because all of the adults have been stealing your snacks. I put some adult snacks back by the coffee. But... I don't think they heard that. So I'm subtly telling them now, eat your own snacks. <laughs> I didn't get Nutri-Grain bars. There's actually adult snacks back there. Anyway, so this week is called Passion Week or Holy Week. And it's the story of the last week of Jesus's earthly life. And so I'm going to read a story from the Jesus Storybook Bible. And this is about what happened on Friday, okay? So today's what? Today's Sunday? Sunday. Sunday. We got a few more days until Friday. And I'm going to give your parents something at the end of our time together today to help you learn about what goes on this week, okay? But I want to read this story. And this story is called The Sun Stops Shining. Can you guys all see this? What would happen if the sun stopped shining? Would it get... Would it get even brighter or would it get darker? Darker. Darker, huh? Are you sure? I think so. What happens when it gets dark? Do you, do you go find a flashlight? Do you light a candle? Do you hide under your covers and cry? That's what I do. Oh, um, um, I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. I just go out there and camp. You go out and camp? Yeah, we went to a camp. Yeah, that'd be fun. Well, this story, the sun stops shining. This is on the crucifixion, okay? It says, so you're a king, are you? The Roman soldiers jeered. Then you'll need a crown and a robe. They gave Jesus a crown made out of thorns and put a purple robe on him and pretended to bow down to him. Your majesty, they said. Then they whipped him and they spat on him. They didn't understand that this was the prince of life, the king of heaven and earth who had come to rescue them. The soldiers made him a sign our king, and nailed it to a wooden cross. They walked up a hill outside the city. Jesus carried the cross on his back. Jesus had never done anything wrong, but they were going to kill him the way criminals were killed. They nailed Jesus to the cross. Father, forgive them, Jesus gasped. They don't understand what they're doing. You say you've come to rescue us, people shouted, but you can't even rescue yourself. But they were wrong. Jesus could have rescued himself. A legion of angels would have flown into his side if he'd called. If you were really the son of God, you could just climb down off that cross, they said. And of course, they were right. Jesus could have just climbed down. Actually, he could have just said a word and made it all stop. Like when he healed that little girl and st uh, stilled the storm and fed 5,000 people. But Jesus stayed. You see, they didn't understand. It wasn't nails that kept Jesus there. It was love. Papa, Jesus cried, frantically searching the sky. Papa, where are you? Don't leave me. And for the first time and the last, when he spoke, nothing happened. Just a horrible, endless silence. God didn't answer. He turned away from his boy. Tears rolled down Jesus' face, the face of the one who would wipe away every tear from every eye. Even though it was midday, a dreadful darkness covered the face of the world. The sun could not shine. The earth trembled and quaked. The great mountains shook. Rocks split in two until it seemed that the whole world would break, that creation itself would tear apart. The full force of the storm of God's fierce anger at sin was coming down on his own son instead of his people. It was the only way God could destroy sin and not destroy his children who hears, who, whose hearts were filled with sin. 
Then Jesus shouted out in a loud voice, It is finished. Can you guys say that with me? It is finished. And it was. He had done it. Jesus had rescued the whole world. Father, Jesus cried, I give you my life. And with a great sigh, he let himself die. Strange clouds and shadows filled the sky, purple, orange, and black, like a bruise. Jesus' friends great, uh, gently carried Jesus. They laid Jesus in a new tomb carved out of rock. How could Jesus die? What had gone wrong? What did it mean? They didn't know anything anymore, except that they did know their hearts were breaking. That's the end of Jesus, the leader said. But just to be sure, they had strong soldiers to guard the tomb. They hauled a huge stone in front of the door to the tomb so that no one could get in or out. Whew. Sad day, huh? But like the song said, Sunday's coming. So next week we're going to hear what happened after Jesus was buried. You already know, don't you, David? Okay, what's your question? You want to tell me a joke? Okay. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, Beth, am I good here? All right. What's your joke, buddy? It's a dad joke. It's a dad joke. All right. We're oh, yeah. good. Yesterday was Saturday. Yesterday was Saturday. Yesterday was a sad day. The day before that was a sadder day. Yes, it was. Because it's sad and sadder. Yes. Very good. <laughs> All right, let's pray. And then you guys are going to go downstairs with Miss Lindsay and Mr. Kent for a treasure hunt. Y'all adults have to stay up here. All right. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him uh, so that uh, he could show us how to live and that by his death we can uh, be free and that we can have a relationship with you. And all God's little people said, Amen. Amen. All right, guys, head on down, okay? So if you have never uh, read the Jesus Storybook Bible, this is one that Lindsay and I give anytime a friend of ours has a baby. This is one of the gifts that they get. And it has one of my favorite descriptions of the love of God in it. And this is how they describe God's love. It's a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. That's God's love for you. Never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. Today we're going to talk about the crucifixion of the Son of God. I know it's Palm Sunday, and I know y'all were looking forward to waving palm branches in the air. But since this is our sixth Easter, we've done that five times. So we're going to do something a little different today. Um, as we survey the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they seem a little bit lopsided uh, because they dedicate some, uh, quite a few chapters to the first 30 years of Jesus, but a disproportionate amount of time to the last seven days of Jesus' earthly life. And so anytime you see something that's kind of out of balance like that, like in Matthew, the first 20 chapters cover 30 years, but the last nine chapters cover seven days. In Mark, it's 10 chapters and seven chapters. In Luke, it's 18 chapters and six chapters. In John, it's 11 and nine. So there's some, some things that are happening during the last week of Jesus' life where the gospel writers are like, we need to slow down. We need to understand this. Because Jesus is marching towards the completion of his earthly mission that he had been given by his Father. And so this week, uh, between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, is called Holy Week. Uh, it's also called Passion Week. And it starts with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem 
on the back of a donkey. He enters it as a king. And so we call this Palm Sunday because as he's riding, people are, are taking palm branches off and waving them in the, in the air and singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're, they're, they're recognizing Jesus. Some people did recognize him as Savior. Some people were just kind of caught up in the moment of the thing, uh, of the, the, the parade. But he comes in as a king. And then after that Sunday, he, the, the, during his last week, he does some teaching he does a lot of teaching. He eats some meals with his friends. He spends a night in a garden praying and sweating blood. People get their ears chopped off and then restored. There's a lot that goes on in this last week. Judas kills himself. Peter denies Jesus. And we, we're going to go over some of that tonight if you can make it uh, for dinner and, and study. But I want to skip ahead to Friday. When Jesus is arrested and he's put on trial. And we read kind of a, a kid's story of what happened. And I hope you guys were paying attention. But at this point in the story, his disciples are, have to be asking, what's happening? What in the world is going on? To Jesus' disciples, their hope for the king was, was unraveling. And to the Jews, their troublesome enemy was finally going to be eliminated. And Pilate, who we're going to hear about in a little bit, this was just another difficult day at the office, trying to please both the Jews and Rome. But let's not forget the main character of today's story, and that's Jesus. Because to him, this was a different day entirely. It was not a surprise. Jesus was not defeated when he died, but it was a day when he would finish his mission. As the eternal Son of God, He made the Father known by His sinless life and by His willing death. And so if you brought your Bibles, get them out, turn them on if they're electronic. If you need one, there's a bunch by the front door. Uh, but we're going to be Bereans today. Uh, we are a part of the Berean Fellowship, and, and we are devoted to the Word of God, just like we've been studying the last several months how the early church was devoted to the Apostles' teaching we're going to walk through quite a bit of scripture today. And what I want you to do is I just want you to try to picture yourself there. Try to put yourself in the story as a bystander, um, as one of Jesus' followers, or even as somebody who has no idea who Jesus is or what's going on. But try to picture yourself there in the story. And as I was preparing this, I, I had initially planned on having all of the kids up here during this time, so we were going to play a little game called Pinocchio. So I'm going to ask you adults to do that too. All right? So you guys know Pinocchio, right? What happens when he lies? Okay. So as we read this through this story, anytime you hear the religious leaders tell a lie, I want you to touch your nose, okay? But I want you to pay attention to the contrast between the truth of Jesus and the lies of the religious leaders. The contrast between the courage of Jesus and the cowardice of Pilate. And we're going to see how the religious leaders ended up being bullies. And bullies are someone who use their strength or power to hurt somebody else, to make them do something they don't want to do. So don't forget, when you hear a lie, be, be like Pinocchio, okay? And we're going to see how Jesus' innocence was confirmed during his trial before Pilate. The Jews were disrespectful, they were deceitful, and they provided threats instead of actual evidence. And so these are the events of Good Friday. Let's look at John chapter 18, starting in verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. He had been arrested in the middle of the night, so now it's early morning. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. These religious leaders, they knew the Bible. They knew God's word. They knew what it said. They knew, and then they had added a bunch of rules and regulations as to what they could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. And, 
And they're getting ready to celebrate the Passover, which is one of the, the annual feasts in the Jewish religion. And, and it was a very special time. And, and they could not enter into, hey, Ray, can we shut the door? They're going to get really loud during the treasure hunt. Um, but they could not enter into a Gentile house. And so before, they, they wouldn't even go in. And, and what, what's striking about that is, is these religious leaders had read the, the Bible. They knew that, that they had been a blessing to bless other people. And they had put their religious rules over relationships with people. Could you imagine if just one of the religious leaders had said, I'm going to go in and, and talk with Jesus. I'm going to go in and talk with Pilate. I'm going to go in and talk with the Roman leaders. I know it's going to make me unclean, but people are more important than rules. Verse 29. So Pilate came out to them. And he asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. See how rude and bullying these people were? Pilate said, take him yourselves, judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected, which was not true. That was a lie. You can touch your nose. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus. This means that there is objective, absolute truth. We live in a world that doesn't believe that, that is running away from the truth. So if you want to be a truth teller, you need to listen to Jesus. You need to follow Jesus. And Pilate asks in verse 38, what is truth, retorted Pilate. Here you have a Roman governor standing before a Jewish rabbi who is the son of God, who is the Jewish Messiah, who a few chapters earlier had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Pilate says, what is truth? And turns his back and walks away. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. You see that... One of the charges against Jesus that he was leading a rebellion against Rome. But here they're asking for an actual rebel to be released. Barabbas, his name means son of a father. Who is Jesus? Son of the father. They're trading a no-name rebel for the son of God. For the son of the father. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Every word of Scripture, every verse of Scripture is important. That one verse you and I will read and be like, oh yeah, they had him flogged. You know what that entailed? They would take Jesus, tie his hands, strap him to a pole, take a whip, that at the end of the whip would have bits of bone and metal 
and hard stuff. And they would flog him. They would rip flesh off of his back. If you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ, it's the only rated R movie I ever recommend watching. Horrific. But remember, we don't want to get things out of balance. As painful and as horrible as the flogging of Christ was, the gospel writers don't spend much time on it. Here it's one sentence. They took, they took Jesus and had him flogged. Almost as if that sucks, but that's not the point of the story. Verse 2 of, of chapter 19. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe, went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Which is true. They didn't believe it to be true. But when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I am he, I'm the king, he was telling the truth. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace. Where do you, where do you come from? He asked Jesus. You see, the Romans, they, they weren't very good at asking questions. Right? He just said, I don't know, who are you, what is truth? And he was real jittery. He didn't take the time to get to know who Jesus was or what Jesus had taught. He asked no questions. So he's like, finally, who are you? Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you could almost see a little smile on his face. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is called Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Did you see what it was like to be there? I can't imagine. You know, they say hindsight's twenty twenty. We know who Jesus is. We know what happens on Sunday. We know that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus died so that we could be free. But in that moment, all the religious leaders knew was here's a guy who claimed to be God and he's taking our power and money away from us. We don't want anything to do with him. In contrast to the lies and manipulation of others, Jesus spoke the truth. He told the truth about his kingdom. Although his kingdom will one day be on earth, it will not come by human methods. And until that time, his kingdom spreads in the hearts of believers, not by war or politics, but by the gospel. I don't talk politics often at the church. But we are coming upon an election season that has consequences. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you to vote or not to vote or what to vote for. But I want to caution you, as important as the political process is, 
it will not save you. The President of the United States is not your savior. He is not worthy of worship. He is not worthy of undying adoration. And I don't care whether you're red or blue or purple or rainbow. Now, should we be involved? Yes. Should we be informed? Yes. Should we vote? Yes. Should we stand up for life? Yes. I'm going to say something that may shock you. We have Republicans and Democrats in this room. We have a few good independents and libertarians. What's the one thing that unites all of us? Jesus. The love of Christ. I don't want to hear any bickering over politics within the four walls of this building. There's a really good book out there called Thou Shall Not Be a Jerk. It's how to talk about politics with friends and family. Jesus is your savior. Jesus is the king. Thus endeth the political soapbox. Jesus also spoke the truth about Pilate's authority. In verse 11, he recognized that his authority comes from God. He said that Pilate would not be Jesus' judge if God had not arranged events to bring Jesus to this trial. God was sovereign over the whole process. He even used the Roman way instead of being thrown down and stoned the Jewish way to die. So even while on trial for his life, Jesus kept fulfilling his mission. He kept his eye on what God the Father had asked him to do. He was telling the truth by testifying about God to his kingdom. And Jesus told the truth because he is the truth. He is the word. He is the light. He is the son who always makes God known. He was in this world for one reason, to declare the truth. He entered his own creation, became a human, was about to die so that people could know ultimate reality, and that's God himself. And in order to do this, in order to to introduce people to God, to that ultimate reality, he had to live a sinless life because God is holy. He had to die to, to make God's righteous mercy known to open the way for sinners like you and me to come to God. Jesus' truthfulness confirms that he is the innocent lamb of God. So we just saw how Jesus is the truth and tells us the truth. And now we're going to see in the rest of chapter 19 how Jesus died for sins so that we can know God. Let's return to the text. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, along with two others, one on each side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. The sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said one to another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. You'll see in this story over and over again, John says, as the scriptures say, or as the scriptures were fulfilled. And we see in verse 25, a picture of that commandment to honor your father and mother. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother Can you imagine that as a mom or as a dad? Seeing your son flogged and hanging on a cross. People spitting on him, slapping him, ridiculing him. I don't even like it when somebody says one unkind thing to my daughters. Like Papa Bear comes out, right? 
So Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, a lot of Marys, right? When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Even in incredible amounts of pain, Jesus cared about people. Later, verse 28, later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so, so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put a sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's the dark day. It is finished. Jesus' mission on earth was to provide a way for you and I to be reconciled to God the Father. See, way back in Genesis, our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, they decided they wanted to be their own gods, to go their own way, and so they rejected God's plan, they rejected God's purpose, they rejected God's word. And from that moment on, God put a plan in place for us to be reconciled to him because when you and I, when we try to go our own way, when we try to be our own God, we bump up against the God who has the way and it creates a little bit of separation, right? And so, as we're walking with the Lord, sometimes our disobedience, sometimes sin, sometimes the sin of other people can, can create some distance. And, and so as we're walking with Him, we need to, to pay attention to what the Spirit is saying to us, to pay attention to what God's Word says. And, and it's not a matter of trying harder, but it's a matter of recognizing that we need God every hour of every day. I can't think of a shorter and better prayer than, Lord, I need you. But all of that would not be possible without this moment, without Jesus saying, it is finished. Now, I don't want you to think that the mission of Jesus is finished, that we don't have anything to do today, because the church has a mission. But Jesus' mission of providing a way for you and I to be reconciled to God, that part of the mission is finished. That means you and I don't have to work for it. We don't have to work our way into God's good graces. It's already done. It's finished. Now is the day of preparation. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. You see, when you're hanging on a cross in order to breathe, you have to kind of lift yourself up to, to get air into your lungs. So if they break your legs, you can't lift yourself up anymore and you suffocate to death. That's why the legs were broken. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who'd been crucified with Jesus, then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, found he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Interestingly enough, the scripture said that the Messiah is not going to have a broken bone in his body. It's fulfilled scripture there, that's pretty cool. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. Here's John t talking about himself. He knows that he tells the truth. He testifies so that you also may believe. The whole point of John's gospel is so that you may believe in who Jesus was and what Jesus had done. These things happen so the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. But he's not going to fear them anymore. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, 
the man who had earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with all the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The details of Jesus' death confirm that, that this was no accident. This was part of his mission, part of his plan, and he stayed true to that mission to the very end. The soldiers led him away like a lamb to the slaughter. He was led to die outside of the city as a sin offering for me, for you, and for us. He was put to death with criminals. He was lifted up on a cross to be the curse in place of sinners. His hands and feet were pierced with a nail driven through his heels. He died as the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Even the small detail of his clothing being divided fulfills scripture, confirms he was the king who died to bring people to God. Everything that I said was predicted in the Old Testament. Everything. Like a lamb to the slaughter, Old Testament. To die outside of the city, that's in Leviticus, confirmed in Hebrews. Put to death with criminals, that's in Isaiah. Lifted up on a cross, that's in Numbers. Curse in place of sinners, that's from Deuteronomy. His hands and feet were pierced, that's from Psalm and Isaiah. A nail driven through his heels, that's Genesis 3. Dying as the Messiah, the King of the Jews, that's from Daniel chapter 9. See, Jesus' enemies thought they finally had Jesus trapped. The Jews brought Jesus to Pilate. They used lies and threats to make Pilate do what they wanted. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. He said it three times, but Pilate had no commitment to the truth. So under pressure, being bullied, he gave the order to crucify Jesus, but Jesus was not trapped. He was finishing his earthly mission exactly according to plan. So in his death, everything that was predicted about Jesus' first coming came true. So in his life and in his death, Jesus was true to the Father. In life, he never sinned, so he fulfilled the law for the sake of us. In his death, he perfectly displayed God's righteousness, satisfied God's, God's wrath. And I'm here to tell you, whoever trusts in him is the way, the truth, and the life can come to the Father because of what Jesus did. That's this week, guys. And so... I have to think that if, if the gospel writers spent so much time on the last week of God, that God in his sovereignty, that God looking at history and working throughout history, that God works really well, but really, really well this week. And so I want to encourage you, if you've got friends who don't know who Jesus is or, or, or people who maybe be looking for things, use this week as an opportunity to be the light and love of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you have to take your Bible and hit them over the head, right? But it could simply be, hey, I was thinking of you this week. I was praying for you. Uh, can I stop by and let's get some coffee? Or, or do you need help cleaning something? Do, whatever it may be, just, just help and serve. And I have yet to meet somebody. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I, I have yet to meet very many people who don't like to eat food. We're having breakfast next Sunday. Most people are just waiting for an invitation to get food and, and to go to church. So who's that one person that you've been, eh, I, I've been, been waiting to, to invite them. Now I want to say it's not about inviting people to this building. It's not about growing Freedom Church. What it is is it's about helping people see Jesus Christ. Right? It's not about us. It's about him. And so maybe as you're talking with someone, it's not a come to the church gathering with me, but it's, hey, let's, let's get together every once in a while and talk about this Jesus thing. All right? But you personally must respond to the way, the truth, and the life. Finally, because Jesus stayed true to his mission to the very end, as his followers, you and I have a mission as well. That mission was given to us in Matthew 28 after Jesus died. And I'm going to spoil next Sunday for you. He is risen. Jesus comes back to life, okay? Amen. 
He gave his disciples, he gave his church a mission to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded. So we look to Jesus' commands. So Jesus finished his earthly mission and has passed a mission on to us. And my prayer is that at the end of our life, we can say what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, that I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Stay true to the mission that God has given you. And let us as Freedom Church stay true to the mission that God's given us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, before Kelly and the ladies come back up to close us in worship, have you guys ever heard of resurrection eggs? All right. So I grew up in the evangelical church, and I'd never heard of these till recently. Because, you know, Christians, we have to do things a little bit weird and a little bit different, right? We, si we sing about the blood. There's power in the blood. We, talk, we have just some weird things. Well, this is one of those weird things, but this is really, really cool. So the church has bought 10 of these, so that's enough for each family with kids to have one. Um, I understand if you have more than one kid in your house, they may fight over this, but what a great way to teach about sharing about Jesus loving and sacrificing for other people, right? Um, but each egg contains a different thing that happens during Passion Week, during Holy Week. And so there's, there's like a little donkey in one, there's a, a crown of thorns in one, there's a really cool cross in one, and there's a little book up here, or there's a book that's in the box, but Miss Denise uh, took uh, and just put together the scripture and some questions. So when, when I first became a follower of Jesus, and then when I first became a parent, I had no idea how to disciple my kids. No clue. And uh, a friend of mine said, well, do you have the Bible? Yeah. Do you know how to read? Yeah. There you go. So this is the scripture that goes along with each egg, and then just a couple of questions to ask a kid of any age, all right? And so uh, right now what I'd like to do is if you, have a, if you are a regular, if you come to church at Freedom Church uh, and you have kids, you can take one. If you have grandkids that don't come here, just wait. And if there's extras, then you can take them home, okay? So Carl, even though your kids aren't here, guess what? You get one, right? Okay. Uh, but this is, this is just one of those things, one of the ways we as a church wanted to bless, bless us. And I had a few people ask, why are we not doing a big Easter egg hunt like we've done in the past? Um, and the quick answer is, Resurrection Sunday needs to be about Jesus. Amen. Not candy, not a fluffy bunny, as cute as they are and as tasty as rabbit is. It can't be about the bunny and it can't be about the eggs, unless it's the resurrection eggs. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying don't have an Easter egg. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt at our house, all right? I'm not saying don't do that and don't celebrate, things like that. But let's keep the main thing the main thing, all right? And that main thing is Jesus. All right, let, let me pray, and then we'll close uh, with our song. Father God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, we honor you. We, um, we are so blessed to be your children. We are so thankful for all that you've done. I just pray this week that we would be uh, reminded about the sacrifice your son made so that we can have a relationship with you and so that our relationships with other people can be mended. Lord, that we may be forgiven, and that we are forgiven, and that we will be forgiven. Thank you for Freedom Church and our faith family. And all God's big people said, Amen. Amen.